The world record for a ski jump is a massive 251.5 metres and it's held by this guy, Anders Fanamel. This video is going to be all about projectile motion and ski jumping is just one example of what we call parabolic flight. We often use the monkey and hunter analogy to introduce the idea of the parabolic flight of a projectile. It is really to get you the idea that vertical and horizontal velocities are independent of one another. In other words, they can change separately. So the idea is that the hunter releases a projectile at the same moment as the monkey he's aiming at drops from a tree. Initially, the projectile that the hunter releases is, has only got horizontal velocity. So in a certain time, it moves a certain distance in the horizontal direction. But also, because the system is acted on by gravity, it falls slightly. It accelerates slightly downwards, as does the monkey who has fallen from the tree. And they fall the same amount. So the next piece of time, the next period of time, the projectile continues to move forwards, but it also accelerates downwards. It moves faster downwards than it did before. The monkey moves the same speed downwards as the projectile. Another period of time passes and the arrow has moved the same distance in the horizontal plane and now it's moved even more in the vertical plane. Its vertical velocity is even greater. The monkey still has no horizontal velocity but has the same vertical velocity. Lastly, another same period of time passes, the projectile moves the same horizontal distance, it has the same horizontal velocity, but it has gained even more vertical velocity. The monkey has gained the same vertical velocity, and so the arrow hits the monkey. Let's take our analysis of this parabolic flight a little bit further. And this could be any object, it could be a tennis ball, it could be a cannonball, it could be anything, so long as it's moving under a uniform gravitational field. So if it's moving on Earth, the force of gravity acting on it throughout its flight is going to be the same. And in fact, when we're analysing this, we think of the only force acting on the projectile as being gravity. So it has the same weight throughout the flight. And that is the only external force. There is another force, which is air resistance. And air resistance always opposes the motion. It always is in the opposite direction of the motion of the projectile. And therefore, it doesn't actually change the shape of the flight. And so really, whenever we're asked a question about this, whenever we're asked to do any more analysis about this, we just really ignore air resistance. In any case, air resistance is so small, we say that it is negligible. The other vectors that you need to consider when you're talking about or writing about parabolic flight is the velocity vectors. This is the notation VH, which is the horizontal velocity. And you will see that throughout the flight, we say the horizontal velocity is constant, it does not change. Initially, there is no vertical velocity. Because it's in a gravitational field, the, it accelerates in the vertical direction. So we have this vertical velocity here. Now, we can actually add those two vectors up, but because they're right angles, we need to use the triangle vector sum. The resultant vector would be in this direction. The resultant velocity would be in this direction. There's a video on how to add up vectors in one and two dimensions as well. And if you struggle with that idea, go ahead and look back at that video. Later on in the flight, it's going to accelerate in the vertical dimension. It's going to have the same horizontal velocity, because remember we're ignoring air resistance. And again, I'll show you the vector sum is going to be as if it was one large rectangle and it is the diagonal in that uh, rectangle. That is the resultant velocity at this point.
point here. The next thing we might be asked to do is to do some numerical analysis of the flight and actually given some data we can calculate quite a lot about the flight. We might be asked to calculate the horizontal distance that the projectile travels. We might be asked to calculate the speed with which it hits the ground. Now usually it's going to involve the first thing you do to calculate the time of flight. So most questions will start in this way here. Given some data like the height, uh, I've called that displacement in the vertical dimension, SV, and gravitational field strength or gravitational acceleration. And then we can apply one of the equations of linear motion to calculate the vertical displacement. The equation is S equals UT plus a half AT squared. Okay, now again, I've done another video on the equations of linear motion, so don't worry too much about uh, understanding that. I'll show you where that comes from in another video, but just how to apply it here to this situation. So we know S. I, what I would do in this situation is I would recommend plug in the numbers that you know and then work back using the inverse of operations. So we know S in the vertical dimension is 10 meters. We know U, the initial velocity in the vertical dimension, is zero because it's not got any velocity in the vertical dimension. We don't know time, so we have to write down time. Copy down the data that doesn't change, a half. A, acceleration, we know that acceleration is 10 times t squared. We don't know t, that is what we want to calculate. We want to calculate the time of flight. Now, straight away, you can actually make this equation much simpler by getting rid of this part here. Zero times anything is zero, so that, that part of the equation is completely irrelevant. Zero times t is going to be zero, so we just get rid straight away. Then we focus on thinking, which parts of the equation can we move? So remember, we need to work the opposite of bid mass, so one of the last things we need to do is the indices. First of all, I'm going to move times 10, times, sorry, a half. The inverse of times by a half is times by 2. So my next line of algebra, I get 2 times 10, 20 equals, uh, pardon me, I was going to write a t squared, but we know what a is, 10 times t squared. Next thing to move is going to be the times 10. The inverse of times 10 is divide by 10. So I get 20 divided by 10, which is 2 equals t squared. But I don't want t squared, I want t. So the inverse of squared is the square root. So my last line of algebra is t equals root 2. And root 2 is 1.41 blah, blah 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 let's just work to two significant figures 1.4 seconds so the time of flight is 1.4 seconds and that's going to be the start point for our next section of this question we're asked to work out what is the horizontal displacement so how far will the projectile go in the horizontal dimension and we know and we're told to ignore air resistance and it's often a clue that you're expected to do this if you're told to ignore air resistance then we're told that we know that the horizontal velocity is always 15 meters per second so we know how long it's in the air for time is 1.4 seconds so we've got speed and time so we can calculate distance Speed is distance over time, so distance is speed times time. So we know both those, 15 times 1.4 equals 
reach for the calculator. Twenty one. So this projectile went twenty one meters during its parabolic flight. The last thing just to say here is how can we actually change the shape of that parabola or the distance which our projectile travels? Well, this gentleman here is wearing a wingsuit and not only has been dropped from a very high height, meaning that his time of flight will be much longer and therefore he can travel further, he also has a much larger surface area and that means that, especially in the vertical dimension, he will have a, a much smaller resultant force downwards and therefore his time of flight will be longer. The other way is to use this idea of an aerofoil and he's doing this as well. His shape of his body is acting a bit like a wing. And what happens uh, with an aerofoil, which is this cross-sectional shape you can see here, which is the cross-sectional shape of a wing, is as it moves forward through air, the airflow is different underneath the wing as it is above the wing. And that means that here we get all the air bunching up and causing a high pressure. Here above the wing, because of the shape again, the air is actually spreading out and we get a lower pressure here. Now, in fluid dynamics, high pressure is always trying to move to a low pressure area and that causes a force on the wing, which is in the upwards direction. So it's that movement, that air trying to get around and past and over the wing that causes the upward force that in aerodynamics we know as lift. Okay, lastly, just to say, if you found that video useful, or if you think that anyone else would find that video, then please do find that video useful, then please do subscribe to the channel by clicking this button here, or share it with your friends. Thank you very much for listening.